bad katulebe chief just emeritus my brother amama mbabazi prime minister emeritus muchara taibwa the honorable ministers who are here my brother Todong, the Secretary General of NRM, the Secretary General of the Democratic Party, stand so that people can know that you are here. <laughs> Honorable members of Parliament, the Olanya family, friends. A lot has been said about our departed brother, uh, let me simply say that I want to convey our sympathies and condolences to the family, to the president, to the parliament, and to the people of Uganda for the loss of our comrade Our com for the loss of our comrade Jacob Oranya. I have known Jacob for quite some time. Actually, Jacob was introduced to me by Mao, the head of uh, DP. At that time, he was not yet a member of parliament. They were just friends, and we met with Mao, who I knew very well, and introduced our brother Jacob, but he also said this man is close to the movement politics. And I'm glad that he grew to become a giant of the movement politics. <laughs> Jacob and I interacted mainly, if I may follow Dr. Eber's point, on running of government especially when I was a leader of government business. He actually assisted me greatly. He assisted me because if he anticipated a problem or he saw some issues, he would not wait for you to come to parliament. He would say, he would give you a ring or even physically meet you and discuss the issues and sort them out. That helped the work of parliament to move faster and to move well. And it also made it easier for government to handle issues in the parliament. I must say what he did to me, he did it to ministers and he did it even to members of parliament. His interest was to see a smoothly running parliament productive and concentrating on serious business that would build the country. Jacob was a very disciplined member of the, of the party, really very good cadre. And I illustrate it by one or two cases. About six years ago, after having been a deputy speaker for five years, he decided to contest for the position of speaker. The situation was tense in the parliament between the supporters of our sister Rebecca, who was the current speaker, and also the supporters of Jacob Bolanya. So, SEC, as usual, played its role, reviewed the matter, and decided that Rebecca Kadaga should remain Speaker of Parliament for another five years, and that Jacob Olanya should wait. But Jacob Olanya got into problems. Because after the second meeting, I had there was some grumbling. 
So I called our comrade, Jacob Olanya, at rather ungodly hours of the night. He said, what's happening? Jacob said, the decision of SEC has been received, but there is substantial resistance among my supporters who are insisting I must stand. They are, they are sure of victory. So I decided, Jacob and I agreed that I should talk to some people on phone. Some of them were actually crying and determined, but eventually Jacob prevailed on them and said, my supporters, please accept the decision of SEC that Rebecca should be the speaker and Jacob continued to be deputy. So it required a disciplined cadre to confront his pious supporters, including those who are shedding tears, to convince them that they should actually accept the decision of SEC. I want to salute him for being a very good cadre who has helped build the movement. So the other area where Jacob struck me is that Jacob was a peace crusader. Jacob was extremely concerned about the conflict in northern Uganda, especially the Lord's Resistance Army and its activities. So, in 2004 December, Jacob Bolanya and I and a few other people went and booked in Boma Hotel in Kitugum and then went to Parabek. That area was completely deserted because of the conflict and at a place called Parudu in Parabek we met Kolo who was a spokesman of Lord's Resistance Army Sam Kolo, thank you thank you and a team of other RRA leaders we talked with them and Nduk Jacob was always a straight talker in terms of resolving issues. He also gave in his strong message that the people of Uganda and the people of Northern Uganda in particular want peace. So eventually, by the end of the meeting, we agreed on the principle of ending the conflict. And to a week or two later, unfortunately, people who had agreed to end the conflict ended up attacking people again. And UPDF did its expected duty of protecting the population. But I'm raising this point that our brother in 2004 was in the bush looking for peace in northern Uganda. <laughs> then, a little later, you know, our sister Betty Bigombe had already met Kony, and Kony had promised to end the conflict, but of course, this again was never realized. But anyhow, pressure for peace continued, and Jacob Bolania continued to play a very, very active role in the parliament, outside the parliament, to make sure that there was peace in northern Uganda. So, in 2006, 2007, 
we embarked on Juba Peace Talks. Juba Peace Talks were chaired by the Vice President of South, South, South Sudan and indeed supported by the President himself. So our President sent us, we met the RLA people, and Jacob and the Chief Justice uh, and Gowin Doro were advisors to the chairman of the peace talks, Riyak. And they really gave him, in my view, very good guidance. But they also kept in close contact with the government delegation, which I led, and also the delegation of the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, at the end of the day, there were direct meetings that we had with COIN in Likwamba, just at the border with DRC. Again, Jacob Bolanya and other leaders, mainly from northern Uganda, from Macholi, the religious leaders, Ro Rotachan, who is the traditional leader, and many others. Uh, Archbishop Ondama was leading the religious team with Bishop Ochola, with the, the district Kadi, Karir. Anyway, to cut the long story short, those talks with Kony after quite a bit of time agreed on one thing with the specific advice of Comrade Olanya that there should be a ceasefire and an agreement was signed and that there should be two camps for Lord's Resistance Army people to move, to move from northern Uganda to South Sudan. And the camp at Winkibur in the eastern part of the Nile, and those who were on the western side to gather at Likwamba. The chairman of the talks, Machel, the vice president, was doing this with a lot of advice from Jacob and his collaborators, uh, his comrades, like Windoro. And then we had people, and I was happy to see the Minister for Gender, I don't know whether she's still here, because she was one of those uh, who was in the talks. And also, Jimmy Akena. I must say, I think the two-year period in Juba must have also strengthened the relationship between these two comrades. <laughs> you know, things are sometimes bad, but they also sometimes have a, a positive uh, or silver lining. They, they can give us the details if we perhaps want it. But anyway, let me continue with the point about my brother, uh, the crusader for peace. In Rikwamba, he told Kony directly to really make sure that the conflict ends. And in other meetings which we attended with him, he was forthright, as usual, straightforward and to the point. I want, therefore, to commend him for the great role he played in, co in reaching the ceasefire that was reached. Now, was this ceasefire real or it was bogus? Actually, it was real because it was agreed that LRA can go through a number of routes. Number two, they can report either to the churches, mosques, or other houses of worship, or they can report LOCs. A number of them reported. I remember talking to Brigade Commander Balikudembe in Padel, and he was with Dominic Ongwen together in 
a UPDF detached. So the fact that you could have UPDF and LRA together, different commanders, it was something positive. Anyway, people gathered in Rukamba and Winikibur, and eventually we agreed with the coin that actually a final agreement should be signed. Kony was due to sign the agreement in Nkwamba, he dodged. President Museveni was due to sign the agreement in uh, Juba. President Museveni flew to Juba to sign the agreement, but was agreed that since Kony has not signed, it is no use President Museveni doing what? Signing. When we are doing all of this, one of the critical political and legal advisors of whatever we are doing was Jacob himself. In the parliament, colleagues will remember, I think uh, the chief just was still a politician perhaps at that time, Jacob fought for, to bring in many amendments in the amnesty law in order to create room to have more and more people benefiting from the amnesty law. Number two, Jacob, everything possible to domesticate the ICC uh, statute. And actually, that helped that helped in the creation, I'm now going to the Chief Justice area, Chief Justice Emeritus, but helped, helped Uganda to create a, a court of law that would try crimes against humanity. And as I speak now, that court is available, and if anyone commits crimes against humanity, we have the capacity, to even not be necessary, to take him to the Hague, because Uganda has developed that capacity. A lot of that legal work, groundwork, Jacob did that work. As I come to the, as I come to the conclusion of these remarks, Sudanese authorities, South Sudanese authorities, realized his capacity. So they decided that Jacob should be given a responsibility to train legislators in South Sudan in legal issues, drafting of bills and the like. And it was not only for people in the parliament, but even for state legis uh, le legislatures. Therefore, I thank him again for increasing the capacity or the people of South Sudan to handle their own affairs, especially in legislative uh, programs. So, in a nutshell, friends, Jacob has gone to Ali. Has gone to Ali because he was a rising star. He was unstoppable. Unfortunately, the criminal death has done its way. But he's a leader who was comfortably acceptable no more, a leader comfortably leading in a chori, a leader with political authority and support in northern Uganda, and a leader who enjoyed national support. I'm glad that the people of Uganda decide to support this patriot, this nationalist, and may his legacy live on, and may his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Right Honorable Deputy Speaker. For the sake of time, permit me to adopt the protocol that has gone on. 
in the reading of today, Ecclesiastics, it says there is a season for everything under the sun. There's a time to be born and a time to die. We were all born, know it, we shall all die. I keep, in judicial terms, I say, the day you are born, you are sentenced to death. It's a question of when the sentence will be carried out. Honorable Gunda has just said, Jacob died too early. But is there really a time that is suitable for death? Is there a time when we think this is suitable for death? Children have been born, uh, uh, died at birth. My mother died when she was 96 and I was still inconsolable. At 96 and I was her last born child. I cried for weeks. So is there a time that we are ready to die? We are never, never ready. When Jacob died, I asked the same question, why? Why? Why now? The man has just been elected speaker. He's worked so hard for it. The country has so much hopes in him. What he stated, he was going to be a transformative speaker, transform parliament, transform the level of debate. He wanted a uh, fact-based debate, focused debate. And everybody said, yeah. Now, a few weeks later, after he had assumed office of speaker that is dead. Why? And uh, I remembered from my student literature days, the book by Shakespeare of Macbeth. Those of you who have read it. Here is King Macbeth preparing for battle. The very, very final battle which would determine whether he lives or survives. And He's putting on his armor. People are helping him to put on his armor to go for battle. Then he gets word his wife, his queen has died. And he says she should have died hereafter. There would have been time for such a word. In other words, why did she have to die now? Why didn't she wait until after the battle and then she dies? But does death really ever wait for us? So we go back to what the bishop preached. Jacob had to die, whether at, at 50, he's 15 years younger than me. Whether at 50, be it at 60 or 100, he had to die as we all have to die. But we look at what he has done. We all are judged by what we have done in our contribution in impacting people. You can impact people negatively. You can, you can cause so much death and destruction, but you can be a peacemaker like Jacob has done. You can be in parliament as speaker, and there is chaos in parliament. He was saying no. And I want to mention two instances where I, I had to deal with him. One, when I was chief justice, a bill known as the administration of the judiciary bill was introduced in the house. Those of you who are in Parliament know that there were mixed feelings about it, to the extent that some private members even introduced a private member's bill um, to, to, to collide with the one that had been introduced by the government. Jacob called me, a surprise call. I got a call, Mr. Chief Justice, I want to give you lunch. Took me by surprise. <laughs> Why does Jacob want to give me lunch? Then he said, there is this confusion about your bill in Parliament. I want to have lunch with you, together with a few other members of Parliament involved, so that we sort out this confusion. And I went and we had lunch at the Serena Hotel. We sorted out the confusion. Without much ado, that bill is now law, and it is transforming the judiciary of Uganda. So that is Jacob. And then when there was this debate on uh, what was subsequently called Toji what was the age, age limit, I want to invite members of parliament who are here and other students to go and look at the parliamentary hazard. When Jacob chaired the first sessions in the debate leading to, the, to, to that bill, 
his words, his admonition, his advice to members of parliament. It is as if he was foretelling them what would happen. I don't know how many people reading his words today would say, we wish we had listened to him. Go and read them. Go and read those words. So this is Jacob. And what do we owe him now? To die he has died. We are sad. I've told you when my mother died at 96, I was inconsolable. We must mourn. Even Jesus mourned when his friend Lazarus died. So we can cry, we can mourn. But his legacy, if he wanted focused debate in parliament, those of you who are in parliament, my, my, my friend, uh, just, um, I was about to say Justice Tayewa. <laughs> Deputy Speaker Tayewa. Please, you can only, you owe it to Jacob to carry out that mantle and make sure there is improved debate standards in parliament. Then you would be having his legacy. If he wanted peace in the country, if he wanted peace in the country, each one of us who are in positions of leadership should ask ourselves, in the actions we do, in this, uh, this, the things we say, are we promoting peace? If this man was promoting peace, that's what we owe to his legacy. And if he wanted development, if he wanted to touch everyone positively, I can tell you that even today, in my own place where I come from, so far away in Obunyarguru, almost everybody seems to talk about Jacob Olanya. He has touched people positively. And let's continue that legacy of touching people positively. May his soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you, the Right Honorable Thomas Taewa, the Deputy Speaker of our Parliament and Mrs. Anita Taewa. I think let me follow suit and say something I actually really don't respect very much, but uh, which I will follow today. All protocol observed. <laughs> I have uh, been writing down a few notes. Um, and uh, I just want to say that uh, I stand before you to express my and my family's deep sadness at the loss of our brother, our friend, and the Speaker of Uganda's Parliament, the Right Honorable Jacob Olanya. We extend our condolences to the immediate family, the children, the parents, the wider family. His constituents of Omoro County Parliament, the government of Uganda, and the people of Uganda as a whole. The late Olanya was a man of many qualities. You had uh, many people out around them here. He was a bridge builder, a consummate advocate of the rights of the ordinary people. He served Uganda with great diligence, dedication, and dignity. And as I just said, he was a bridge builder. He was, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, in the seventh, sixth, seventh parliament um, on a multi party ticket. I don't know if there was such a ticket. But there are those of us in the Parliament who subscribed. Sorry, I took long to begin speaking. This is because uh, Anurva Cheng will bear me out that Corona is still around. It's, uh, it's still around, and uh, 
one of the methods of spreading of corona is the microphone. Uh, so I don't take chances with it. Seventh Parliament, on a multi party ticket. And of course, you know, he came in under the movement ticket, uh, under the movement political system. And uh, we had a lot of debates and differences. We, in the leadership of the movement, noticed, noticed him, a young, brilliant, nationalistic man, as usual. We approached him and found him amenable. And one thing led to another, and we built confidence and trust between us. And I speak this with authority because I represented the movement in that effort. It was that confidence that we developed in him that led to his election as the chairman of the particularly important committee at the time of legal and parliamentary affairs. It was a crucial position because we were debating the amendment of the Constitution at the time on a matter which was uh, very emotive, where there were differences of opinion, and where the side that he belonged to was totally opposed to that amendment. So why did we elect Jacob Oranya, the chairman? This was a committee where we had majority membership, where we could have the chair if we wanted. We chose Jacob Olanya to chair it. And the reason was what I've just said, that we found that he was not only a knowledgeable person, he was not only a brilliant guy, he was nationalistic. He did not espouse causes of sectarianism of any kind, tribal, religious, or anything of the kind. And he did, uh, indeed, perform that role very well. As you know, the Constitution was amended. He did a sterling job. I then had a long and thoughtful I had long and thoughtful moments with him after the successful removal of term limits from the Constitution and so on. Of course, I was asking him to declare his support for the movement. He told me that although he clearly shared the political opinions of the movement, he believed that leadership was a relationship between the leader and the lead. He did not want to leave his people behind. So he stood on a moderate party ticket and unfortunately he lost. You remember that? He lost 20, 2006, I think it was, he lost. So <laughs> I, I stayed with him. We had a very close relationship, me and the Jacob. In the next election, he stood on the movement ticket, and I instructed our campaign task force to focus on Omoro and make sure that NRM captures it under the leadership of Jacob Olenya. We did. We won Omoro then, and that was part of the beginning of the political turnaround in a Chauri sub-region. Of course, we had had candidates like uh, the then chairman of Guru, Ochora, my brother, the late Ochora, Otema, Charles Otema, although he was in the army, he was very active on the ground. His young brother, Richard, wrong, 
was acting like uh, a lion. Honorable Winnie Doro, Honorable Betty Begombe, we had many other people who, of course, had been fighting for the movement at the time. But we had registered laws after laws in elections. When we won tomorrow, that was the beginning of the turn round. And I'm happy to say that uh, although I lost when I stood for president, they voted well. So from that time on, Oranya served as an effective member of parliament until his demise. Tayeb was, uh, he says, uh, of course, you know very well, the speaker is the representative of the house itself in its powers, in its proceedings and its dignity. The role the speaker plays by virtue of office requires the position to be filled by a dedicated, senior, and experienced parliamentarian who must have intimate understanding of parliamentary life, of the problems of members of parliament collectively and individually, and of the moods and foibles or the minor weaknesses or eccentricities in the parliamentary members' characters in the House an experience which can be acquired only through many years spent on the benches of the house itself. He must have a deep-seated reverence for the institution of parliament and understanding of what lies behind the outward ceremony, these gowns and things you wear as speaker or now as deputy speaker, and a faith in the democratic government. A newspaper once talking about this office in what they call the Mother of Parliament, Parliaments in the UK, wrote, the office of speaker does not demand rare qualities. It demands common qualities in a rare degree. A good speaker is not necessarily an extraordinary person. Therefore, he is an ordinary person, but an ordinary person of the highest caliber. That was Jacob Oleng. He obviously had all these qualities and more. So we do weep the demise of this great Ugandan. We weep because we loved this kind leader who persevered through all manner of adversity. Not for the incident, let me tell you another story. When he lost and he had not, he had stood on the multi party ticket in 2001, was it one? 2006. Then he quickly came and he asked NRM if we could send him to the East African Legislative Assembly. And of course, I knew we didn't have any better person in the party to, re to represent Uganda in the East African Legislative Assembly than Jacob Olanya. So I recommended him to the caucus. He was recommended by the vice chairman, Mzei. Uh, Moses Chigongo, and the president didn't take sides as he doesn't normally take sides in elections of this kind within the party. He was turned down. The NRM guys told me, no, this man became NRM only yesterday. How can we send him? when you have people who have been sweating for NRM all this time. So, Jacob Olanya has experienced 
many adversities. And he persevered through them all. Not for the sake of ambition or vanity, not for wealth or power, but only for the people and the country he loved. So he is dead. But let us all be comforted by the words of one writer who said, it is not the length of life, but the depth of it that matters. I always give the example of Jesus. Jesus lived for 33 years. Today, this service is about Jesus. You heard what the bishop was talking, what the Arch the Chief Justice has repeated, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It is 2,000 plus years. The young man died at 33. We still talk about him. So what matters is not the length of life, but the depth of it. Jacob, without repeating what many people have said, achieved many things. Many have not succeeded even when they have lived for 90 or more years. Have not succeeded in achieving. So, friends, as someone said elsewhere, in reference to a widow who had lost her husband, who had rendered an exemplary service to the people, and this is my message to you, the children, the relatives, to all of us Ugandans, and I quote, as you know so well, the passage of time never really heals the tragic memory of such a great loss. But we carry on because we have to, because our loved one would want us to, and because there is still light to guide us in the world from the love they gave us. Jacob Olanya would want us to carry on. So we carry on. We are all grieved that Olanya's awesome presence is with us no more. But we have pride because he was one of those people who made a difference to the lives of those around them. His understanding, his love, and the care for others were apparent to anyone in his presence. So, as Bishop Mahima said here, Jacob has left an indelible mark that can't be erased by his demise. Death can never take a good man away, for in the hearts of the people he inspired, the legacy remains and is continuous throughout generations. Thank you.